This is Electronic, a new show which focuses on electronic dance genres. House, electro, techno, drum and bass and dubstep. Our first guest is from San Francisco, though originally from Detroit. His inspiration and passion from Detroit electronic music led him to produce innovative productions and start his own label, Dirty Bird Records. With successful tracks such as Deep Throat and Who's Afraid of Detroit, it's called Von Stroke. <laughs>
from from your you know early beginnings in Dirty Bird and, and up until how you've done now that you started off with talking about mothership before, what was the inspiration? What was like the idea behind starting a, that kind of sibling label? Uh, because Dirty Bird, just kind of what we're talking about, has yeah. that kind of vibe. Beefy edge to it. It's like we're doing fun tracks for, yeah. for people to have fun. But not only that, it's very American sounding. Right. And I'm getting a lot of demos all the time that I like and I play, but they're a little harder edge techno or really deep house. And so there's no know. possible way that I could You're release them on Dirty Bird and make it make sense, but I really like them. Right. And I think they're adventurous in some way. And so I, I wanted to have another label where we could put the stuff that I really like, but isn't really made for Dirty Bird. It's not the right thing. Spreading your creative yeah. wings, my friend. Yeah, it's good. I like to say it's the people that grew up on Depeche Mode, right. end up on Mothership, right. the people that grew up on James Brown, end up on Dirty Bird, yeah, end up on Dirty Bird. Yeah. This second guest has been DJing since the early 90s with electro, house, hardcore and then to his known genre, drum and bass. He then set up his well-known record shop, Black Market Records. It's Nicky Black Market. Right, just take you back and just go back to where you come from and like start talking about the tunes that you made back in the day and yeah. mixtapes that you was just busting out. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, 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 <laughs> I started in the shop, uh, well, it's now 20 years, it's 20 years ago this year. And uh, it, it, it's funny because it, it, one, one thing, one, one side of me thinks, oh, it's only like five minutes ago, which <laughs> it seems like it. And then on the other end, I think, mm, it's 20 years ago. This is how long it's been an era. things have been, yeah, two decades. And it's crazy, and it's like, it's, it's still got the shop rolling, you know, we still sell records, I still play records. But let's take you back to where you, when you first come on, and it was like, was it like, a, not something that you really wanted to do, or something well, that was I always wanted to do. Yeah, that's serious. Always, from a little child, from a kid. It's funny, because, um, you know, mom, my mum was uh, heavily into jazz, yeah. and she knew a lot of the jazz cats. She knew, like, um, she knew people like um, uh, Cleo Lane and Johnny Dapper from there, just like the, a lot of the, the jazz cats. Man, the time and the you know, like the, the Beach Boys, the Beach Boys. I suppose when I was growing up, I was listening to, to a lot of jazz, and, like, a bit of everything, really, you know. So, influences from, from everything. Jazz. And that led you on from the. Where did the break thing side come into it? Where did that come into it? Oh, I mean, it's. I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to play music. It's just funny. Musically thing. involved. Yeah, just involved in music or something, and not realising it at an early age. You know, yeah. the great big thing, well, great big thing really to me is it's this British musical movement. Yeah, it's a British thing and it's like uh, it is, it is. When, I, when I went into <laughs> when I went into the shop it was like uh, could have gone either way really you could have gone uh, could be could have, you know well, at that point that there shop well I, I went in the shop at, uh, I went in there in 1990 right. so uh, at that point there, I could have gone either, either direction. All the DJs at that point really there could have gone either direction because it was very open then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you could have either, could either gone to play house or gone to play, you know, like hardcore sort of gear. Even though obviously everything, you know, this, this scene is like, at the, the early days, of, you know, everyone's playing hardcore break beat, as you would call it. You know, like early hardcore stuff. You know, and then uh, obviously the rave things exploded then. Happy hardcore. Yeah, well, even before the happy hardcore thing, the rave thing. You know, yeah, yeah. early Euro, that Euro sound. Right. You know, <coughs> and it was like um, could have gone either either direction really. But obviously this this is this is our music really. Drum and bass has it has a British breakbeat music. <laughs> Where do you 
see drum and bass going in the future because I, I hear a lot of drum and bass these days and it's kind of gone commercial side and don't mention no names after you know that but it's gone kind of commercial do you, think, do you feel drum and bass has lost its way do you think it's going to be definitely back? definitely not most definitely not it's you're always going to have certain characters that that can carry it across commercially that, that, can, go, it's that can cross over that can cross over and that will open doors for other people which is great, you know what I mean? This is really, really good because you're opening doors for different people, different, you know, even different scenes. It's opening more doors. I mean, like the dubstep thing. Yeah, yeah. The dubstep real. thing come out of the drum and bass thing. It's yeah. just another branch off a tree. Yeah. So I can see it, you know, healthy. The thing about drum and bass, it will always be underground. It always has been, always will be. And that's how it survives. It's never been a commission. It still goes under there. It still stays under there, stays under the under the radar, and it and it survives. That's how it thrives. You know, someone so said to me before, oh, um, about um, about they're saying about oh, drum and bass is it seasonal? So I said, no, not at all. You know, it's like because you've got other scenes that are seasonal that that will take you to these holiday islands and that. You know, then then all of a sudden they have a low pitch or whatever. Drum and bass is a, a constant, constant influx. Yeah, constant influx. Right? Yeah. So where do you see drum bass in two planets and with yourself being involved in that? Well, still here, still still playing the tunes, hopefully. And, and, giving people what they want. This next guest is a jungle DJ producer innovator who started off DJing in 1989. He started to release his tracks in 1992 and had massive releases like Everyman, Superman, Murder You and more. It's owner of Mix and Blend Recordings, Kenny Ken. Let's take it back to the past where you started, 1989, what you've seen is 1988 when you actually first started. Yeah, 1989 I actually started on the main circuit and um, what made me decide to be a DJ was I used to go raving and then from raving I had to go work because I used to do shift work. <laughs> and the shift work and raving they don't mix, you know, no, it doesn't no. mix at all. So I just thought to myself, you know what, I could be, I could do that. I mean, I, I, I've dabbled in music before but not took it seriously, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could do this, and I like the music anyway. So I just got some decks, and started practicing out a mix. And at that time, it was like acid house, right? Yeah, acid house, techno, garage, um, US garage. That is. So when did that take it to like to '91 when you first did like the breakbeat started coming through? Like, you know, I mean, the breakbeat was always there from day one. Right. Okay. You know what I mean? But it just wasn't as prominent as it was in '91, '92. '91, it was like a really yeah. big thing. Yeah. Like yeah. Charlie, like the the breakbeat, the breakbeat came in like Rebel MC started bringing in some stuff yeah, yeah, with yeah. the fin, you know what I mean? And um, when they when they brought in, when the breakbeat came in, one thing led to another and then it just blossomed into jungle. Is that where you thought that you could actually bring something to the table as in production wise or? I wasn't thinking about production then. Right, right, I was, right, right. I was not thinking about production then. All I was thinking about was playing music and making everybody dance, you know what I mean? That's what I wasn't thinking about production, you know? It's only about 94. Right. 1994, that's when I made my first tune. I think it was 94. Yeah, it was 94 I made my first tune. So our jungle was really, yeah, like, yeah, really yeah. big at that time. Yeah, because like, the jungle, I excelled in that, you know what I mean? That, yeah, was, that was me, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, everyone said that I was this and I was that in jungle, so I thought, well, I've got to make a tune now, you know what I mean? But I wasn't really feeling the vibe to make a tune, but I knew that I, had, I wanted to make one. That was your next step. And, yeah, and lucky for me, I, I bumped into the right people. And the tune I made, every man was big. a big kick, you know what Absolutely I mean? So, you know, it was just one of them things, everything fell into place, you know what I mean? And is that is that what the tune that actually perpetuated you where you find yourself, you know what, this is it for me? Yeah, yeah, I mean, after every man, I never really made no music after that. I was dabbling, but not taking it seriously because I was just into the, I was just into the whole rave scene, you know what I mean? Like, mm. DJing, raving, partying, you know what I mean? I was just, that's how it was for me back then. Because you are a prolific writer when people look at your stuff and yeah. you got to yeah, discover. Oh, yeah, I've got enough history. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I've got enough history. I mean, you know, you, you must be telling me stuff that I can't remember, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? So, but, but back then it was just, 
it was just um, it was just raving, having partying, a good time. having a good time, DJing, being Kenny Kenny. You know what I mean? It's only after when AWOL finished in '96 yeah, 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 yeah. when I decided, right, if you want to have some longevity in this game here, you've got to fix up and do something. You know what I mean? Sure, so sure. that's when I thought well, I'm going to start my record label, which was Mix and Blend, and. Um, um, build a few tunes, sign a few tunes, look for new artists and all that, you know, and, but even then I wasn't really taking it seriously, you know what I mean, it's just, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm a serious person, you know what I mean, I just take every day as it comes, you know what I mean, that's, that's how I've always been. Now, now I'm still running my label, Mix and Blend. Um, got a lot of projects going going on at the moment. I played a couple of tunes out there tonight. Got smashed yeah, yeah, it. Absolutely killed it. You know, out um, I'm working with. I've started to work with these guys called Savage Rehab. Right. Yeah. 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 Big guys. Yeah, they've yeah. just they've just been signed to be. Yeah. Right. You know, I think I could have signed them to my label, but like they're my friends, and I want them to. I want them to get big. So V's got a V recorders has got a bigger profile than my label. Right. So I said to them, well, they want to sign, go, go for it, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's great, big of that. So, but Brian G from V said to them, they can still work with me. That's big, that's you know what I mean? Because he knows that I can sign if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, out of respect and everything, that's what I'm working with, you know what I mean? Because even though this, even though you're doing it for the money and you know, for the love of the game, it's having right, you know what I mean? At the same time, it's not really about just you. No, no, I mean, no one's bigger than the scene, you know what I mean? Exactly. No yeah, one, no, yeah. no one. If you think, if you're a DJ, you come into this thing and you think, oh, I'm, I'm DJ Quick Mix, and I'm a bad boy DJ, and I'm bigger than anyone. Don't think like that. Because yeah, 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 you yeah, just yeah. get knocked down to size, you know what I mean? I've never, I've, yeah, I've never ever, you find that a lot of the DJs who have been around as long as I have, you know, none of them have ever thought that they're bigger than the game. Yeah, it's true. You know, we've just, Play, that's what we want to do, we just want to play music and see the kids dance, you know what I mean? And you know, make them talk about me on Facebook and MySpace and I'll get a kick out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. someone writes something on my page, how can you you done this last night? That's good enough for me. You know what I mean? That's my ego kind of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. my enjoyment, just seeing the kids. You know, even at my age now, I won't tell you how old I am, but I'm <laughs> in my forties. I am in my forties, late forties. But um, you know, so a person of my age you got 17, 18 year old kids coming up to you and saying to you, boy, can you get that? You can sell. And you mix tapes as well. After so long, you can still do it. You know, that makes me feel good. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, you know, a lot of the kids tonight are bloody old. I'm old enough to be their dad after them. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 This next guest only had his career take off in the last year. He is a dubstep DJ and producer from the Midlands and has remixed the likes of Lily Allen, Ellie Golding, William Morbit, Kid Sister and more. With his own tracks released on his own label, Boomtings Recordings, it's Jack Wobb. So, as 
take you back to where you like where you where was the dubstep and you know she's coming across and you've got the vibe and the feeling from that. When did it first make the parents to you and you stayed in the back sort of feedback from that? Um well I well, when I made the uh, girls for a same sort of time the Lou the girl remix came out. Yeah, yeah, and that was kind of where and change the status of was hitting the mainstream. I'm pretty sure it's kind of obvious how my sound's kind of well, quite commercial. Like, it's like really very I think it was a band that would cross over as well, really, because the like, guys who just mentioned and Machine's mentioned like the Lou Reed to the kill. Yeah. That just went totally mainstream, even though it's not very much underground, so you want to change the fact that it And it was kind of um, almost a little follow up to that. I think the people on the scene were looking for something. People who were quite into dubstep were kind of taking on the oh, okay. So let's move it on to like your, 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 your actual productions that you do yourself now and the sort of like material that you're using and the, the software in particular that you use, what is it is, that's a particular software that you're into. Yeah, um, literally from the start I've been using Reason and then I've got Reason Record and can't wait for Reason 5 to come out. Right. But um, <coughs> I've, recently, I've always used um, Pro Tools or Logic to do vocals and like. But um, yeah, it's a mixture of most things really, in Ableton as well for vocals. But being at uni as well, did you have that, did, that was just all you see? Yeah, 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 and I did a whole, a whole module in Pro Tools, for example. It just, yeah, it's, kind of, it's, good, it's an advantage really. You know, so when did you start DJing, when did you put things to self? Like, did, did you start production first and then, or was it DJing, or was you DJing first? Well, I was always, I kind of, almost a combination, because I was always in bands, I wasn't really DJing. I did the occasional night. Uh, so playing like play instruments yeah, play, play instruments, but the, I kind of did a few DJ sets back at home and um, DJ never became serious until I got um, got agents and the music kind of taken up online and what actually had to be traveling with business. So yeah, it was only until the last year that it got serious, but right, right. before that I've been DJing here. Yeah. So you've been basically, you've always been like a studio person and you've got a DJ? Well, initially, which isn't quite obvious from what at the moment I'm definitely more of a producer than I am a DJ. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of studio sessions lined up over the next few months, morning to the year. Uh, yeah, featuring a lot of people out. So we can talk about how the DJ set itself and what I've read. And I've not had a place in here from what I've set to myself, but from what I've read and from what I've heard from the place that you've got a great piece of it. Um, it's kind of, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, well, with my music, um, it was just ages ago I got hold of a, a sample pack and I just obviously actually love very beat jump But um, in my sets at the moment, I'd, I'd actually love to play the music that's on my iTunes, for example, on my playlist, but it's far too, far too weird if people want to get it. So I try and get the next best thing, things that people can dance to, but it's something I actually love. So it's, um, yeah, I do mix it up a bit, yeah. Like, and that shows in, in the actual material that you produce yourself, but like say that you use a lot of brain beats in, yeah. in places where you wouldn't necessarily. Yeah. And what led you to actually incorporating brain beats back into it? Yeah, I think that comes, that it definitely comes from my drumming. So I'm drumming. Like, right, so you're a drummer by trade anyway? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I've been drumming most of my life, and I, I don't know, I just, I hear that in my head, so I put it in, and it seems to work. Right now I'm entering Rock signing more lettering, lettering, stepping in Lost your favourite MC, check the bin I wanna know what set you're in And who rests with her and him My next guest is from Germany and has been DJing since the early age of 13 and producing since 14 A well-known production partnership, Dell and Heinrich, ended in 2006 In 2007, he released his first track under his new solo name, Reboot Goodbye world I'll see you in the next life. Uh, I just want to talk really, Reboot kind of came out to see in 2005, but you have a yeah. big, big history before then. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to the point of then becoming Reboot? Yeah. Um, so I started producing music basically when I was a kid, like 13, 14 years. I got my first drum computers and always did it just on the side as a hobby for fun, playing like, I don't know, small clubs from time to time. 
and um, in 2004 or 2005 I moved away from Frankfurt for a while job wise and had a lot of time and so I started building up my studio again, started producing and out came this reboot stuff and I showed it to friends, they wanted to release it and yeah, I don't know, five years later, yeah, yeah. So was it the transition musically, like what, what kind of stuff were you producing before and like what was the difference really between who you were now and yeah. your alter ego? Well, um, uh, before that I was producing with a friend, Marco Della Donna, and we were more producing, I don't know, it was like completely crossover, also like pop and rock stuff, jazz. Yeah, um, you got a lot of influence. And yeah, totally different, different style, not, not particular this four on the floor techno or house stuff um, and uh, I don't know I was pretty much influenced by that time by Gecaro and Villalobos and Luciano and when I turned the machine on just this sound came out it yeah, just happened straight away it was you were pretty quickly welcomed as well I think it kind of yeah. exploded you had a lot of really good productions that I would start producing on the like kid like how how did it sort of explode for you? Was it more about your production or was it more about your DJ sets? Like how did that really come about? No, it was definitely about the productions in the beginning and um, well, after one or two years of playing then, um, people realized okay, he's actually able to play a good DJ set or a good live act and then it came together and by now it's like a com complete mix 50-50 between the productions and my performances. But of course, to um, have people's attention, you need to have productions. For yeah, of course, it's the only way to make it now. Really. Absolutely. So, you, you do a lot of live stuff as well. What kind, what kind of stuff does your live stuff encompass? Like, and which do you prefer, live sets or DJ sets? Okay, that's hard to say. Um, well, f first of all, the live set, of course, is only my music. Uh, yeah, only my yeah, own yeah. production, yeah. which is mm -hmm. the biggest difference uh, to a DJ set. And, um, well, when I'm on stage, I try to keep keep the whole set as open as possible to um, be able to improve and to see what the crowd really likes yeah. and what they don't. And, um, yeah, well, basically, it's all my own production. So it's a very intuitive process when I'm on Long on stage, work exactly, yeah. and I love that. But I absolutely equally love DJing, and it's like it depends on it. when I have a time where I play like ten live sets in a row. I'm fed up with you it, and I really yeah. miss DJing. You've got more room. Same around, and so it's pretty. It's pretty cool though to have the possibility to switch and to do something different from time to time. Getting more exactly. So how did you come to the attention of Cadenza? Then what was it that brought you to them? Because Luciano is very much a hero for a lot of people and he's a great person to be affiliated with. Totally. How did that happen? Well, classic. I sent him a CD. I didn't know him at all personally. You know, I just started to play a couple of times. A friend of mine told me, he's like, man, you have to send this stuff to Luciano. And one night, I was pretty hammered. I just <laughs> burned the CD, put it in an envelope and sent it to his house. And two weeks later, I got a phone call from him. And that's where it all started. He's a good person to have on side. Okay. Well, he that's the first is. track from you, and it was a bit darker than really than Cadenza at the time. Yeah, well, um, I had loads of different productions by that time, but Luciano picked out that one track, Be Tougher, um, which was kind of dark and like eclectic and I know. You know, it kind of. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, he just loved it. And so, so, but the B side is more like happy, more housey, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, well, but uh, the other productions I made on other labels were all. Like completely different to that. Yeah. So, Cadenza, still massive involvement there. You've played for them in a beat there at the Pasha, the yes. Pasha, and you've also got uh, an album at Cadenza. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course, I will. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be part of the Sunday shows that we play in Pasha and Ibiza this year. And um, we're absolutely happy to say that the party is just a bomb. It's, yeah. it's like really going off. The people love it. The atmosphere is great. And I'm playing there um, seven times. And I played a back to back set with Luciano as well there. Um, okay. Yeah, and it's absolutely amazing to be part of that family, part of that concept, the Vagabundos. And we're having 
loads of like off parties as well in Ibiza. Uh, Ushuaia, Ushuaia, Novum, uh, Hotel Corso, wherever we just jump around the island and and yeah, um, I don't know, go crazy wherever we are. Luigi, I quite do Luigi, it's generally carnage. Yes. Uh, so I kind of just spoke to you a little bit about then. Some people were a little dubious about Pasha being the home for something of underground music. It's generally Amarillo uh, and those kind of things. So I was asking you, how does it fit there? Um, well, a lot of people have been talking about that before um, before we finally started uh, the parties, and I kind of can understand that they were like, careful with their opinions, mm -hmm. let's say diplomatic, um, um, because the program that Pasha was running for the last couple of years was quite commercial yeah. and for the masses. Um, but I'm, I must say I was surprised the first night we have there that the music we play fits so perfect in that club. I mean the venue is beautiful yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the music we play is just sexy, funky house music and that does fit in there yeah. perfectly well. Yeah, it's nothing too dark, and, is it? No, it isn't. And, and Pasha is really, the guys from Pasha are super happy that they finally made the step and yeah, got cool some up. underground yeah. quality music in the house and um, this is paying off definitely. And the album as well, is that out in the last yeah. few weeks? Yeah, the album came out like three weeks or four weeks ago, something like this. And um, yeah, it's going, thank God it's going really well. I'm really proud of it, really happy. And yeah, it helps us to have a good season. Our next guest has not been on the drum and bass scene that long and already has releases on Digital Soundboy, Shogun Audio, Critical Recordings and more. With remixes for Sabre, C4C and more to release this year, it's Rockwell. minimal drum and bass but I don't think I do. I think I want a broad, very broad spectrum of drum and bass and yeah everything seems to be going right for me at the moment. It seems to be people picking up on my tunes so yeah. Well let's go back to let's go back to where it started like, say okay. in 2009. Okay. Uh, what, what led you into the drum and bass scene? What was it that actually captivated you? So? Um, well like going way 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 back as in like, how I first got into the music. Like, where I came from I lived in the middle of nowhere like in the middle of the country. There wasn't really like any raves and I didn't hear drum and bass until I was about 18. Right. And that was basically, I came home one night from, from some club on a Friday night. My CD player didn't work. So I turned on the radio and heard Fabio and Groove Rider. I know exactly the tune they were playing. They were playing Adam F, brand new, brand new funk. Oh, sick. And it just came into the start of that breakdown at the start. And I was just like, what is this music? It, was, it, just, it just took me from that. And then after that, I just was staying up Friday nights, swapping tapes over, and like getting my C90s out and recording the show. <laughs> and then, but there still wasn't anywhere for me to go out and like kind of experience drum and bass, like how it's meant to be experienced, until I went to Union Bristol. And then I saw, I saw Hype play with Craze at Cafe Blue. And that was the first drum and bass night I've ever been to, and I was just like, just, yeah, the whole energy of it. That's a big night, that's yeah, the eternal night. Yeah, I was just, it just blew me away, completely blew me away. And then, ever since then, it's just been, massive part of my life. But like you say, like you, you fell in love with it as soon as you yeah. heard it and it was just by chance that yeah. you found it. Yeah. Was it something that as soon as you heard it you think, right, I can do this, I can be part of this scene? Was it no, it wasn't. Actual I mean, it's, sort of? it, from, I mean, from where I was, I didn't know anyone, especially like when I first heard it on Fabio Groover, I didn't know anyone that DJed, I didn't know anyone that produced. It wasn't until I went to Bristol and I started to go into a few raves in Bristol and then a couple of my uni friends, like one of them had a pair of 1210s. And I saw him mixing, I was like, you know what, that can't be too difficult. <laughs> so I've got a bit of musical background, I was like, that right, can't, right, can't right. be too difficult. So I got a pair, I think I got a pair for Christmas. And I forgot my mum. <laughs> best, best Christmas <laughs> present I ever had. Like. And then, yeah, I, could, I could just bought loads of records and just got into that. And then it got about two years into DJing and it just kind of... Rolled. What year was that when you, that was... Not that long ago, man. We were like 2004. 
Germany and has been DJing since the age of 14 in 1989. By the early 90s he was playing house and techno music in various clubs and is well known for his long sets of over 10 hours. He's had various releases on Cocoon, Cadenza, Oscars and more. It's Andre Galuzzi. Um, through him, uh, I had the chance to, to 
work in this club really, really early, so when I was really young, you know, when I was 14, and uh, yeah, when I was there, I picked up classes and making clean, you know, but I always had my eye on the DJ and the ear on the music, you know, and then uh, one time I go to the boss and said, oh, man, can I play a little bit, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, nobody was there, then he let me play, and uh, yeah, it started like this. <laughs> right, cool. And did yeah. it happen that one day one of the DJs was ill? Mm. He was sick and he couldn't make it. And that was yes, when you, exactly. was that the first time you got to play to a full Exactly, party. exactly. And, you know, I, as myself, it's such a life changing experience yeah, yeah, when yeah. you actually get to play to a yeah, party. Yeah. And it goes well. <laughs> you know, so I take it that went well then, did it? That, was a, that, that first experience. See, you know, of course, it was for me, but it's like um, spring in the cold water. Yeah. But it uh, was for my, for my, I didn't know how to mix, how to. <laughs> to uh, the turntables, you know, and in the good old days they had the, you know, the Torrance turn turntables, there was the really old ones, not right. the technic. Oh, right. so, so they, they were belt drivers. Yeah, and it was right. not jumping like this, and it was not yeah. really easy, but uh, I don't know, I just did it, I have my, my, my feelings, and then I made cuts and blah, 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 and then I was going into it. Yeah. And then I started to, to work in a, yeah, like, like in a bar, night bar, yeah. where all the people um, coming before they go out, you know? Yeah. And uh, there I start really my, my DJ career. So then, um, how long did it take you before you start to get, you know, really big gigs and move out from the bar and kind of... Well, I started 1991. I guess and yeah five six years needs to, to get into it to get the practice you know yeah. but um, I start really early uh, to work at uh, a regular institution yeah no no first in a distribution called Neuto right where everybody was working in the bars like Ricardo Villalobos, was Anthony Rota Heiko Laux uh, I understand maybe a lot of people, they are big known uh, names. Yeah, now, yeah. yeah. And they start at this time with me in this record. Of course, so you had all these yeah. people around you. Yeah. Was, uh, so I want to talk about that time in Germany. Yeah. This is before you started producing, you know, and you started to get booked, you started to do yeah. parties all around the Rhine and this kind of stuff. And how was it, how was the scene back then? So it must have been very early in the German dance yeah. music culture, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, people like, um, you know, like Sven Raff and these people. Yes, was yes. he already big, or was it still yeah. just happening? He was already big before the techno scene, right? Yeah, with this uh, um, um, off project, you know, yeah. and Elektrokastalza. What was what he was doing as like a you know techno dancing? Had that really started to? Was he a big name in techno at that point, or was it just you know? Yeah, no, I mean, right? he was a real known um, musician party guy so wow. uh, and then <laughs> and then he started when he, he uh, bought his own club in Frankfurt right, yeah. he, he made the decision to, to play just his music you know and then he gets really big of course you yeah know? and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah and everybody was there at this time you know oh, I loved it so much so for everybody it was like okay that's the place you know we do what we want here you know and uh, we danced our asses off <laughs> But uh, I thought, hmm, I don't know, maybe I have to go to, to Berlin because in, in this time Berlin had a completely other sound. Right. So, and I thought, maybe I'm the first one there with a kind of sound, you know. Right. And I think I did it. I was one of the first DJs that moved to Berlin because when I came, uh, when I moved to Berlin, uh, there was nobody there from. from I can't be so I you know, just right. Berlin, you know. Right, so you're the first person from that Frankfurt yeah. yeah, scene. Totally. Actually, that's quite a brave move then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I said, okay, maybe it's going to be hard, but uh, I do it, I do it. Yeah. Well, it needs a long time, but I did it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. You then, you then um, hooked up with Tressor, didn't you? 
Okay, you tried so the beginning, yeah, because yeah. I know I knew some people at this time and uh, played there one time and I liked it a lot and then there was the resident. Yes. But after a while I was not so happy anymore and um, I stopped there. Right. I um, then I tried to make my own parties and then was uh, I meet this guy from Oskut and um, the master the group the club called Oskut, yeah, yeah. in Bergheim, in yeah. Panorama Bar. And yeah, we, have, um, uh, we had a good, uh, good time together and then we said, okay, I'm, I'll be resident here now and uh, yeah, then it's done. So that's, so that's what I was going to yeah. get into that. So when you, you hooked up with those and then you started to really, because that, around that time you started, uh, we were talking before, mm -hmm. you got, um, you started to get your releases, um, sat license to plus eight, and yes. then you started to do your own mix compilation. Yes. You also got the thing with the yes. Andre Andre. Yes. And then um, you started to, you did a cocoon mix compilation. Mm -hmm. Was that the point where you really thought, well, I've moved to Berlin, this was a good thing to do, I'm with the right parties. You know, how did it, you start to get your, your own mixed compilations out? Yeah. And, and that was, and that, how was your life at that point from, you know, from when you started? Did you really start to feel like, yeah, okay, things are going, you know? I'm yeah, really yeah, I think so. it was going really good for me. Even at this time when with this Osgood club yeah. opened, it was amazing because there I had a chance to play how long I wanted, you know? And I think I was one of the first DJs in Berlin that played this really long sets. You know, so we must say actually, we must say Andre was famous at this time for playing really long sets. Ten hours was like a standard yeah. thing for you, wasn't yeah. it? Twelve hours. So, yeah. so this was a, you, you were one of the first DJs to really just yeah. Because in Berlin it was not so. I don't know. Now it's different because now a lot of DJs living there. You know, Eric Harder, of course, he's a long player and blah blah blah. But uh, this time, yeah, it was new and the people was like, oh, he's playing like, you know. <laughs> for this edition of Electronique but you can catch us on our next show for more interviews and music. For more details and chance to see the full interviews of our guests please see electronique.tv.